Welcome everybody. It's a, a spectacular afternoon here in Manhattan and I'm pleased to be here with you to talk about the IAS meeting 2021. Today is also Rosh Hashanah. And so for those of you who are celebrating, we certainly understand that maybe today was not the most convenient. In the spirit of that, we've added another live broadcast one week from today. So for those of you who are on today, thanks for joining us. And please let your colleagues know that they could join us a week from today for the same talk. We do award CME credits for today's presentation. As you can see, 1.25 credits are available. And so not just CME, but we award ABIM mock points, nursing contact hours, pharmacotherapy credit, and pharmacy contact hours, 0.125. You will be emailed the instructions for claiming credit for these. I'd like to thank our supporters of today's webinar, our platinum supporters, Gilead, Merck, and Viv, our silver supporter, Janssen, and the bronze supporter, Thera Technologies. They did not have any input into the content of today's webinar. A Couple of things about navigating the webinar today. I will be asking poll questions and a separate window will show the poll question. You choose your response and then we'll display the responses after the poll closes. If you have questions today, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. The chat function will be live if you wanna chat, but if you wanna ask a question of me, please use Q&A. Okay, let's start with a poll question, pretty easy. Did you attend IAS 2021, which was virtual this year? And obviously the answers are yes or no. Go ahead and vote. All right, 11% of you said yes, and 89% said no, so great. So this is a nice review of a conference that many did not have the chance to attend. Second question. Where are you viewing this webinar from? Is it from the West, the Midwest, the South, the East, or outside of the US? Okay, so 42% from the East, that's the number one choice, and about equal measures from all of the other four areas, West, Midwest, South, and outside the US. So welcome everybody. Okay, and let's jump in. So I'm Trip Gulick. I'm the Chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at Weill, Corn Medi Weill Cornell Medicine uh, in Manhattan. And our learning objectives, I'm gonna describe the latest developments focusing on HIV treatment and prevention from IAS 2021, as well as the latest data on COVID-19 in people living with HIV from the conference. Two pretest questions. Approximately what proportion of the world's population of people with HIV is currently taking antiretroviral therapy? And you see the choices, 25%, 33%, 50%, 75%, or 90% globally. Pick one. And let's see the answers. Okay, so the most, oh, nice bell-shaped curve there. Uh, the most popular answer was 50%, 37% of you said that. About equal numbers chose 33 and 75%, and then some a quarter, zero chose 90%. Well, we'll see if we can answer this question during this presentation. One more pretest question. Which of the following HIV prep regimens is not currently under clinical investigation? Is it daily oral TAF FTC, weekly TDF FTC patch, monthly oral Islatrovir, 
every other month injectable cabotegravir or every six month subcutaneous lenacapavir. Pick one, one of these is not correct. Okay, let's see the answers. All right, interesting. So the most popular choice was weak TDF FTC patch as not being in clinical development. A fair number chose daily oral TAF FTC, and then smaller groups chose the other choices. Well, we'll cover all of these in today's webinar. And I'll tell you the right answer at the end. Okay, well, the first thing to say is that during the IAS meeting during the summer every year, the UN AIDS gives an update of their global AIDS report. And this year they entitled that Confronting Inequalities, Lessons for Pandemic Responses from 40 Years of AIDS. And as most of you know, 2021 did actually commemorate 40 years since the first cases were described. And uh, you see the link to this global AIDS update down on the bottom. I picked out a couple of things which I thought were worth reviewing uh, prior to jumping into the conference. So here's the world map of HIV prevalence. That is what percentage of the population in countries around the world are HIV infected. And what you see is the Western hemisphere in general is less than 0.5%, a couple of exceptions in the North of South America. Then you'll notice most of Western Europe is the same, but as we go to Eastern Europe and particularly Russia and some of the Eastern European countries, you see rates of HIV up to 5%. That is a growth area in terms of HIV infections. Much of the rest of Asia and the Pacific is again, less than 0.5%. And then as we're accustomed to seeing Africa most affected with sub-Saharan African countries, somewhere between three and 20%, and then the Southern African countries, up to 20% of the population living with HIV. Here was one of the bottom line slides. HIV remains a global health crisis. In 2020, last year, there were 37.7 million people living with HIV, including 10.2 million who were not on treatment. And so if you do the math there, 27.5 million or 73% of people are currently taking antiretroviral therapy. Despite that, there were one and a half million new HIV infections last year and 680,000 AIDS-related deaths. Those are the bottom line statistics globally. What we're looking at here on the left are new HIV infections globally over time. And you can see we have made substantial progress. So going over the last 20 years from 2000 to 2020, the slope of the line goes down. So nearly 3 million infections back in the year 2000 and down to under 2 million by 2020. You can see that did not make the target that was established in advance by the UN AIDS. Over on the right are AIDS-related deaths, and you see the peak year for deaths with nearly 2 million people dying per year of AIDS-related deaths has also come down markedly, didn't quite achieve the goal of 500,000 by 2020. Consequently, new targets have been set for 2025, so just five years or less now, four years from now, uh, you can see it's going to be challenging to make the new infections go down that far. Um, perhaps AIDS-related deaths may reach that target. New HIV infections are not the same worldwide, and this breaks it down for you. So we're looking at infections and deaths. New infections are in the red line, and you can see many areas of the world uh, continue to show a decline with two exceptions. And uh, here's Eastern Europe and Central Asia, 43% increase in new HIV infections last year. And the other area of the world where there was an increase was Middle East and North Africa. Note other areas of the world showed decreases, Asia, the Caribbean, 
Um, Africa, Latin America stayed flat, Western and Central Africa noted decrease, and Western, Central Europe, and North America. In orange are AIDS-related deaths, and you see similar trends. The two, one area of the world where AIDS-related deaths is going up um, is Eastern Europe and Central Asia, 32% increase, all of other areas of the world having decreases. Well, here is the famous 90-90-90 treatment cascade. So how are we doing globally by the year 2020? And the answer is close. So 84% of people living with HIV knew their status. Of them, 87% of those who knew their status were on antiretroviral treatments. That would be, if you do the math, 73% of the population of people living with HIV. And of those who know their status and are taking ART, 90% were virologically suppressed. Again, if you do the math, that's 66% of people living with HIV. So essentially not quite 90, 90, 90, but 84, 87, and 90, pretty close. Here is the trends for both adults and children in terms of the proportion with suppressed viral load globally. And you can see promising trends even over the last six years. So adults going from about 40% to 67%. Uh, and kids going from less than 30% to 40%. So significant progress. What about who is being newly infected with HIV? If you look at the distribution of HIV infections, so this is all HIV infections, not just new, uh, you can see some trends here. So if you look globally, 11% uh, of people living with HIV are sex workers, 9% people who inject drugs, 23% are men who have sex with men, 2% transgender women, 20% are clients of sex workers or sex partners of all the other key populations. And that leaves about 35% of people who likely acquired HIV through heterosexual sex. So these are the groups focusing um, efforts to prevent HIV infection worldwide. Well, one other notable thing that happened this summer came from the United Nations, right, right just to the south of me, about 20 blocks. And uh, that was the UN General Assembly passed the 2021 Political Declaration on HIV AIDS, Ending Inequalities and Getting on Track to End AIDS by 2030. So an ambitious political goal that came from politicians through the UN. And what did they say? Well, they committed to a new HIV cascade. We've been living with 90, 90, 90 for quite some time. They now have a commitment to reach 95% aware of status, 95% in care and on ART, and 95% with virologic suppression. So the new goals, 95, 95, 95. Ensure over 34 million people are on ART, which again, if you do the math, a substantial proportion of people living with HIV worldwide. Prioritize combination HIV prevention, that is multiple modalities. Ensure its availability and use by over 95% of people at risk for HIV, including in the key populations we just reviewed. So another 95. And then for pregnant and breastfeeding women and children, ensure 95% of pregnant and breastfeeding women have access to combination HIV prevention, and that 95% of pregnant and breastfeeding women living with HIV achieve and sustain virologic suppression. And the last 95 children exposed to HIV are tested, and if positive, provide ART. So political statements can be powerful motivators, uh, particularly from the UN. Okay, but you came here to hear about the IAS 2021. It was held in July from the 18th to the 21st. And as mentioned, it was a 100% virtual conference. 
So what did we learn? Let's focus on ART initial regimens. So you know from the USDHS guidelines, and I'm proud to be the co-chair of these, these were recently updated uh, just a couple of weeks ago in August, that the recommended initial regimens for most people consist of one to two nucleosides with an integrase inhibitor as the third drug. And the integrase inhibitors are now down to two. Only two are recommended, either Bictegravir combined with TAF and FTC, co-formulated, or Dolutegravir with one of several choices for nucleosides, Abacavir 3TC co-formulated, or either form of tenofovir and FTC or 3TC. And then the fourth regimen here, of course, is the two-drug regimen, Dolutegravir and 3TC, with the important caveats, not for people with viral loads greater than 500,000 copies per mil, not for people co-infected with hepatitis B, because of course only one drug, 3TC, would be active, and no drug resistance results uh, to compromise the regimen. So how are we doing with these top-line regimens that we use so commonly today? Well, we got some follow-up data. Jose Arribas from Spain uh, presented the durability results on two parallel studies that when combined enrolled over 1,200 people. And it was a head-to-head -head comparison of the best regimens we have today, essentially the preferred regimens. It was TAF, FTC, Bictegravir, over 600 people, versus two nukes with Dolutegravir, again, similar size. The data he presented were four years of data, but actually the last year, the third to fourth year, was an open label extension where everyone could elect TAF, FTC, Bictegravir for the last year, and that was over 500 people. Bottom line, significant responses. 79% were less than 50 using a very strict missing equals failure analysis. 99% were suppressed less than 50 using a missing equals excluded analysis, essentially an on-treatment analysis. Overall, for the first three years, Bictegravir non-inferior to Dolutegravir, and there importantly was no treatment emergent resistance in any patient on this study. So this one study tells us that these first-line regimens are both durable, both the Bictegravir and Dolutegravir-based regimens. And then a parallel follow-up durability study was presented on the Gemini 1 and 2 studies, enrolling over 1,400 people. And it was a head-to-head -head comparison of the new kid on the block, the two-drug regimen of Dolutegravir 3TC, versus the conventional TDF, FTC, and Dolutegravir, and over 700 people in each group. What we learned new was the three-year follow-up data, and you could see both regimens did well. So two drugs, 82% below 50, and three drugs, 84% below 50. So the two-drug non-inferior to the three-drug regimen. Now, the other number here is interesting, 63%, what's TMD? It's target not detected. So you, you know when you get a viral load result back, it'll say less than 50 detected or less than 50 not detected. And we don't know the clinical significance of that. Um, and it may be artifactual from the lab, but it's interesting that about the same number of people on two or three drug regimens had uh, 63 to 65% target not detected. There was some concern early on that two drug regimens, perhaps you would see more blips or more target detected, but in fact, that was not true. So these two studies combining four studies together show us that our first line regimens are durable. What about switch studies? Well, remember why we switch, and this is from the guidelines again. You might switch for adverse events, drug or food interactions, pill burden, pregnancy, cost, or sometimes just to simplify the regimen. And the fundamental principle of switch is to maintain virologic suppression. How do we do it? Well, we review the history, we review prior toxicities, and try to assemble all prior drug resistance testing results. In general, within class or even between class switches, 
usually works if someone comes in undetectable and there is no pre-existing resistance. And we now have a number of regimens recommended in the guidelines based on clinical trial and published data. So two drug regimens like dolutegravir rolpivirine, the one we just mentioned, dolutegravir 3TC, a boosted PI with 3TC or FTC, or less commonly, a boosted PI with an integrase inhibitor. All of these have a track record for switch regimens. What are not recommended for switch regimens? Well, any monotherapy. And then a couple of uh, particular regimens, boosted atazanavir and raltegravir because of uh, suboptimal performance, and maraviroc-based regimens not recommended. Once again, remember concomitant hep B infection if you do switch to a regimen with fewer nucleosides. Well, what did we learn new about switch at the IAS meeting? The first thing was a study we have been following before called Tango, as in it takes two to Tango. And this was switch from TAF-based ART to a two-drug regimen, dolutegravir 3TC. This was a phase three non-inferiority open-label study, and it enrolled people who came in on TAF-based ART with a viral load less than 50, no concomitant hep B, and no prior virologic failure or nuke or integrase resistance. This was the design of the study. So they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either continue their successful TAF-based regimen or to switch to the two-drug regimen of dolutegravir 3TC. And then at the end of three years, the uh, TAF group was allowed to switch to the two-drug group and they continued to be followed. So who were these uh, people who enrolled? Well, TAF FTC plus a third drug, as you would guess, just under 80% were on an INSTE, inst an integrase inhibitor, and about two thirds of them were on boosted L-vitegravir. 12% on rolpivirine, 7% on boosted darunavir, and they had been on these regimens an average of three years. Importantly, they looked at metabolics and the mean weight was 82 kilograms. The mean BMI was 27, that's in the overweight range, and 11% had metabolic syndrome. So how did they do? Well, here's the good news. So three years out, you can see that people did well, 82 to 86% suppressed. So TAF-based regimen, continuing it, 82 were suppressed, and switching to the two-drug regimen, 86 were percent were suppressed. That did achieve non-inferiority after three weeks. They looked at inflammatory marker changes, again, with the presupposition that two-drug therapy might allow more inflammation. They measured D-dimer, CRP, interleukin-6 levels, really found no big changes over time and comparable between the two arms. And then they looked at metabolics, and you could see both arms did gain weight, Dolutegravir 3TC gained 2.2 kilograms, and those who continued their TAF-based regimen, 1.7. You can see in general, lipids went down with the switch to two drugs um, and increased slightly with the continuing TAF-based regimen, and then not much difference in the other parameters, metabolic parameters that they looked at. Finally, this whole thing about target not detected. So they looked at any difference between dolutegravir 3TC in the switch study or continuing the prior regimen and basically saw no difference. So 35 to 43% had target not detected, 10 to 12% target detected, and very few people were over 40 copies per mil. So they concluded that low level viremia less than 40 target not detected was similar between the two or three to four drug regimens that they tested. Well, another switch study new was called SALSA, and this is switching not from TAF-based, but from any ART regimen to the two drug dolutegravir 3TC. It was phase three from 17 different countries, randomized open label, again, non-inferiority with a small margin, and they enrolled just under 500 people. They were treatment experienced on stable ART, so two nukes with an INSTE integrase inhibitor and NRTI or a boosted PI and had to have viral load level less than 50, no chronic hepatitis B, and again, no prior failure or integrase or nuke resistance. And the randomization was continue the antiviral regimen, 
half did that or switched to two drugs, dolutegravir 3TC. Who were these enrollees? Average age was 45, 60% men, 40% women, 19% black, 9% Asian, 60% white, and they were doing well. Their average CD4 was 670. When they came in, they were taking two nukes and uh, over 40% were taking TDF. And then you can see most people were either taking an integrase inhibitor or a non-nucleoside with 10 taking a boosted PI. And they'd been on this regimen five to six years. Well, how did they do? They did well. 93 to 94% of all people continued to be suppressed by the end of a year. No patient had confirmed virologic failure or withdrawal. No patient had resistance. The discontinuation to the drug-related adverse events was low, less than 2% in each. Serious adverse events were also low, and incidentally, none were treatment-related. They did look at weight change, interestingly, on the dolutegravir 3TC arm, plus about 2 kilograms and 0.6, continuing the prior regimen. So all in all, the switch to the two-drug regimen from any suppressive regimen was considered non-inferior. Well, another regimen we've had our eye on is the all-injectable regimen of cabotegravir rilpivirine. And this is based on three studies that we've been following for a while. And one is called FLARE. Uh, the early results were published by Chloe Orkin in the New England Journal of Medicine. This enrolled treatment naive adults, over 600 of them. They went on a standard oral regimen of abacavir 3TC dolutegravir for 20 weeks, and then if suppressed, went on cab rilpivirine, first an oral regimen, and then switched to monthly IM injections. And then the other group, the other half, continued their oral regimen. And this, once again, was a non-inferiority study. The 48-week results were published in the New England Journal and showed non-inferiority of the all-injectable regimen. What did we hear new at IAS? Well, we heard the 124-week results. And I'll show you on the next slide. The parallel studies were called ATLAS with a similar design, but it took people who were doing well and switched them to cabotegravir rolpivirine. And again, most people did well, virologic suppression over 92%. Uh, once again, the all injectable non-inferior to the oral regimen. And we heard the two-year results at Glasgow last fall. And then the interesting ATLAS 2M study recently published uh, took people from the other studies um, or on standard of care ART and tested a novel regimen of cabril pivoting given every eight weeks, that is every other month, and compared that to the every four week cabril pivoting. And you'll note that the doses slightly vary. A very small non inferiority regimen or margin of 4%. And again, everyone did well. Uh, suppression in 93%, and so every eight weeks, non-inferior to every four weeks. And these data are currently under evaluation at the FDA. So here was FLARE week 124. As mentioned, randomized open-label non-inferiority that enrolled treatment-naive people, detectable viral loads, no hepatitis B um, surface antigen, and no non-nuke resistance mutations. And they continued to follow over 200 people. And how did they do? Well, they did well. So 80% at week 124. So what's that? That's uh, just under three years. Uh, intent to treat analysis were less than 50 copies. So it continues to be a durable regimen. They did say what happened since the year two analysis, five additional participants had detectable viral load. One had a few in integrase resistance mutations. Um, safety and tolerability, as you would guess, injection site reactions were more were the most common. Other side effects um, not common with these regimens. So this, uh, these studies that I just showed you, particularly FLARE and ATLAS, led to FDA approval, as you know, back in January. Very important wording on the all injectable regimen, indicated as a complete regimen meaning you can just use injections, for HIV in adults to replace the current regimen, so thinking of it more as a switch option, 
in those who are virologically suppressed on a stable regimen, no history of treatment failure, and no known resistance or suspected resistance to either CAB or rilpivirine. And then the guidelines came out shortly thereafter and made some concrete recommendations. And so said recommends monthly, so the every other month has not caught up yet, CAB and rilpivirine as an optimization strategy for people on oral ART with documented viral suppression for, for at least three months who have no resistance to either medication, no prior failure, no hep B, are not pregnant or planning to become pregnant and don't have drug-drug interactions with CAB or rilpivirine. And then they do suggest the oral lead-in, although there is some emerging data that that may not be necessary. Well, what about risk factors for virologic failure? This was the subject of two presentations at the a a IAS 2021 meeting. And one of these was subsequently published as you see here. So they looked at people who had virologic failure. In this cohort, over a thousand people, 13 had confirmed virologic failure from the studies by 48 weeks from ATLAS, FLAIR, and ATLAS 2M. Those are the three studies I just showed you. They went back and tried to search for risk factors for virologic failure. And almost all had zero to one of these risk factors. And you can see very few people failed. However, 3% had two or more risk factors and then failure became much more common at 26%. So what were the risk factors? They're shown for you in the table. The biggest one of them all by far was rilpivirine resistance associated mutations, RAMs. And that gave you a 40 fold higher risk of virologic failure. It makes perfect sense, right? Two drug regimen, if you have resistance to rilpivirine, you're going to fail that all injectable regimen. So that's the most important. We need to screen people carefully for rilpivirine resistance. Low week eight rilpivirine trough concentration increased your odds of failure by five times. Well, that speaks to adherence. Baseline HIV-1 subtype from the studies, an unusual subtype found mostly in Europe, uh, increased your risk of failure by six. And then having a higher BMI, slightly 13% increase um, of the risk of failure. They concluded that virologic failure is infrequent and multifactorial. But again, I go back to number one, rilpivirine resistance should be thought of as a contraindication to this all injectable regimen. Well, uh, the French also looked at risk factors for CAB rilpivirine. They had a cohort study of ART naive patients followed over 10 years in three large Parisian academic hospitals. So they had over 4,000 viral sequences and they searched that database for risk factors for failure just to describe how common it was. They looked at viral subtypes as well as reverse transcriptase and integrase sequences. And they looked for evidence of CAB rilpivirine resistance mutations and their association with subtypes. So much more diverse subtypes than you'd see here in the States. 39% had subtype B, the most common one in North America, but 32% had a recombinant, 5% had subtype A, and 85% of them had one of those at-risk subtypes, A1A6. They also found resistance-associated mutations. 16% had CAB integrase mutations, 14% had NNRTI mutations with resistance to rilpivirine. So 10% of the sequences altogether had genotypic risk factors for CAB or rilpivirine failure, either rilpivirine resistance, which we keep emphasizing, or this unusual A1A6 subtype. And they concluded that this reemphasizes the need to check a genotype and the viral subtype prior to initiating the all injectable regimen. That's particularly so in France in terms of the subtype or in Europe, we'll say. Okay, what about the logistics? So that was the subject of the customized study. How do you implement long acting injectable CAB and rolpivirine? So this was a phase 3B hybrid implementation in effectiveness survey 
uh, that was done in 2019 and 2020. And they basically asked staff members, MDs, injectors, administrators from five different kinds of clinics, federal qualified health centers, academic, private, foundation, and HMO in eight different cities. And they also fo followed over 100 patients who had switched to long-acting cab and rilpivirine and simply recorded what their thoughts were. So most of the staff found the injectable regimen acceptable, appropriate, and feasible. And 78% uh, felt that the optimal implementation into the clinic setting was achieved over one to three months. But the staff did perceive barriers, as shown for you here. Uh, in green is the baseline thoughts about barriers, and these are quite common. So worries about keeping monthly appointments, transportation, how do we flag missed visits, staffed resourcing, what do we do about missed injections, um, failing therapies due to missed visits, management of patients with other needs, and injection soreness. But you see over time, purple is month four and then blue is month 12, that many of these concerns receded as they began to implement. And you'll note that the duration of visit length actually shortened. So early on, month one, it was nearly an hour, but by month 11, once they got the swing of it, uh, about a half an hour. And then they looked at the impact of COVID for patients. So over a hundred people were implementing injectable cabrolpivirine during the time of COVID. And they were gratified to see over 90% maintained their dosing schedule monthly despite COVID disruptions. 7% used temporary oral therapy, which is recommended if they miss a dose or rescheduled their injections. 19% said that they had a COVID-19 impacted visit uh, that required a missed or rescheduled visit or quarantine or diagnosis or clinic closure. So these were common events. Um, but ultimately they asked people, uh, do you prefer the long acting? And these were all people who had switched to it. So they were, uh, we'll say biased towards liking it. And they found it almost uniformly acceptable and they preferred it over going back to oral regimens. So just a snapshot of logistical data for the all injectable regimen. What about pregnancy? What did we learn new? Well, the SAPAMO study is a study we've all been following closely. This looked at the association of dolutegravir and neural tube defects. Rebecca Zash up in Boston presented the follow-up data. They now are looking at Botswana birth outcomes in almost 70% of total births in the country. And the way they do this is that midwives conduct exams of all live or stillbirths, and then any abnormalities, they take photographs and send them to blinded review by experts. And since 2014, they've had over 190,000 evaluable births with 140 neural tube defects. And most recently they added another 40,000 births. So big study population. You'll recall there was an association between dolutegravir and neural tube defects early. And that's what's shown for you here. So early on they found a 0.3% incidence, but then when they looked again, it had fallen to 0.19. And then most recently it had fallen to 0.15. So actually has gone down by half. When you compare it to risks of other antiretrovirals, you begin to see some interesting data. And this is from uh, Rebecca's presentation. So the worrisome time, at least initially, was dolutegravir at conception. But ultimately, that has not panned out, as you can see, not statistically different now with the newer data from non-dolutegravir regimens at conception or efavirenz at conception, or dolutegravir started in pregnancy, or in fact, any ART started within pregnancy. No difference in neural tube defects. The one remaining difference is dolutegravir at conception versus incidence of neural tube defects in women without HIV, although you can see even that is approaching uh, the uh, not statistically significant. So the conclusion is that this is a rare event. What do we know new about PrEP? Well, here's a snapshot of PrEP right before COVID. 
And what it shows you is that only 23% of Americans who were at risk and PrEP candidates, according to the CDC, were actually taking PrEP. And then significant racial ethnic differences is shown for you here. So 63% of white people who were at risk were actually taking PrEP, but only eight to 14% of blacks or Latinos, significant discrepancy. What happened to PrEP during COVID? This is from a pharmacy claims database representing over 80% of US retail pharmacies. Um, so they captured many people who were initiating PrEP from 1219 to 1220. Mm -hmm. So essentially mostly at the, in the time of COVID. And you can see uh, over 123,000 people were starting PrEP. The um, prevalent PrEP users, so who were they? 58% were young um, adults, 26 to 44, and uh, the vast majority, 94% were men. What you saw was a progressive decrease in PrEP initiation from 220 to 420, and that's shown for you over here. Black is total PrEP, which goes down, and you can see both TAF FTC in red, and TDF, FTC, and gray, all three went down from February to April. Well, those of course were the beginning of the first outbreak of COVID in the United States. So the number of PrEP users went down through May, but then afterwards began to increase again. And you can see that in the black line that it rebounded towards the end of June and then they followed people through the end of December. The most pronounced decreases were in white, people more than other races, ethnicities, and in the South, more than other areas of the country. So I guess what we would have expected. Well, the DISCOVER study has been ongoing for some time. This is a head-to-head -head comparison of PrEP regimens. Uh, TDF-FTC considered the standard versus uh, uh, TAF-FTC, the, the newer TAF uh, formulation of tenofovir. This was randomized double-blind non-inferiority phase three. We've heard previous data, what was new at IAS USA was the three-year data. And the last year they did allow open label crossover to TAF FTC. And this was a big non-inferior study, over 5,300 people. What's shown for you here are the number of infections. So if you look in the first year of the study, small numbers, seven to 15 infections. And look at the sample size here, over 5,000 people. They looked at uh, baseline to year two, again, small numbers, uh, eight to 15. And then the new data was year three. And you can see there were only three new infections on the people that were followed. So PrEP continues to remain uh, active and doing its job um, in people who take daily oral therapy with either of these regimens. They looked uh, also described people who changed to TAF FTC in the third year had increased bone mineral density, increased glomerular filtration rate, increased LDL, increased HDL, and increased weight. And so a lot of this probably is the switch from TDF to TAF or TAF. Well, we learned about PrEP in Sub-Saharan Africa and the emergence of drug resistance. This was the GEMS study, which stands for Global Evaluation of Micro Microbicide Sensitivity. What they were doing was monitoring HIV drug resistance in the context of PrEP rollout programs in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it was supported by USAID and PEPFAR. So the current report analyzed drug resistance mutations and adherence in HIV seroconverters in TDF-based PrEP rollout programs in four Sub-Saharan African countries, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Eswatini, and South Africa. There were over 100,000 people taking PrEP in these four countries. And there were 229 reported seroconversions over a three and a half year period. Most of them supplied a, an RNA sample for analysis. Interestingly, three quarters were women and over half were under the age of 25. So mostly young women. Well, what did they find? 30% of samples had insufficient RNA. So there was no results. But of the ones they could amplify, 
uh, they successfully sequenced 57%. Of them, about half had no drug resistance mutations, but 45% had at least one major drug resistance mutation. About 20% with the M184 IV, as you know, conferring resistance to 3TC or FTC. 3% had the K65R, 3% the K70, and both of those confer tenofovir resistance. And 28% had NNRTI mutations, but you'll remember they weren't taking NNRTI, so these are actually transmitted mutations with HIV infection really had nothing to do with PrEP. So when they analyzed the group with no resistance mutations and assessed their adherence, which they did with dried blood spots and correlating the levels, as you might guess, that group had low adherence. So low adherence means they didn't select resistance. On the opposite end of the scale, those with significant resistance mutations to tenofovir or 3TC, in general, they had high levels of adherence. So obviously, if, if you take the drugs um, and become HIV infected while you're on them, that predisposes to resistance. So they concluded that there was a high level of drug resistance conferred with these PrEP programs in Sub-Saharan Africa, kind of a word of caution. What about using PrEP in transgender women who are on feminizing hormone therapy. This was a report, a nested study of 24 transgender women who were participating in a transgender women specific PrEP demonstration program in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil over a two and a half year period. They were taking estradiol plus spironolactone and then added PrEP after 15 days and did full, full pharmacokinetic kinetic analyses at week 12. The good news was estradiol levels really didn't change significantly from baseline to week 12 while taking PrEP. And you can see the numbers here going from 596 to 511, so not statistically different. That's the uh, area under the curve, estradiol. And the Cmax, again, not statistically significantly different. PrEP adherence, as you might guess, was slightly variable. Six women took uh, doses every day, 13 took four to six per week, and five took less than two. None of the women seroconverted during the study, and this they concluded oral PrEP and FHT can be used together. Lastly, what about investigational drugs? We always look forward to the newest information available from these conferences. The first is the drug is Latrofer. So this is an investigational nucleoside analog. It's an adenosine analog. It's a DNA chain terminator. It inhibits reverse transcriptase by preventing translocation. So it's a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, or NRTTI. One of its properties is that it has a very long half-life, 50 to 60 hours, and that will allow quite infrequent dosing. We know from earlier published studies that it's a potent antiviral. This is one dose at time zero. 10 days later, you see a two log drop at the highest doses tested. That was published last year. Also of interest, it can be used at low dose and parenterally, so an injectable form. And uh, I just showed you the single oral dose data. Well, what did we learn new? There's been an ongoing phase 2b study in treatment naive people. Uh, they had viral loads that were detectable, CD4s above 200, no resistance, small study, 120. They were randomized to one of three doses of this latrovir, 3TC and duraverine, the NNRTI, or the control arm was two nukes and duraverine. And then they switched to a two drug regimen of is latrovir deraverine after week 24 to 48, if they achieve virologic suppression. The week 48 outcomes were just published in Lancet HIV, and you can see they did well. So between 77 and 90%, regardless of the regimen, suppressed below detection, below 50 copies. What was new at the meeting was 96 week data, so another year of data. And remember, they all switched by this time to Zlatravir plus deraverine. Um, and the other group continued the triple combination. 
Overall, there were similar rates of adverse events and no drug-related adverse events or discontinuations. Headaches and diarrhea occurred in small numbers. What was interesting was the metabolic data. So is Latrovir deravirine 3.5 kilogram weight gain versus 2.6? And if you looked at those who gained more than 10% of their weight, you saw nearly 20 or over 20% in both groups. You can see in general cholesterol increased slightly in the Islatravir deravirine and stayed pretty equal in the TDF arm. And then they looked at bone mineral density. Um, and in general, they found less decrease in the Islatravir arms, as you would expect, than the TDF arm. Well, one of the exciting things about Islatravir is thinking about its use monthly as PrEP. Imagine PrEP if you could take it once a month. So that was the subject of this phase 2A study presented by Sharon Hillier from Pittsburgh. Randomized double-blind, multi-center, placebo-controlled phase 2A study. It was in HIV-negative adults who were at low risk for HIV acquisition. So this was not an efficacy study. It was a pharmacokinetic study. And they enrolled 242 people. They randomized two to two to one to receive is Latrovir 60 milligrams once a month orally versus double that 120 once a month versus placebo once a month. And then they followed them over time. They were looking primarily at the pharmacokinetics of is Latrovir triphosphate, which like most nukes is the active form. And how did they do? Well, first of all, it was well tolerated as you can see over here. Uh, take a step back. The patients enrolling were two thirds women, 42% black, 53% white, and they were young with the median age of 31%. Um, they did have adverse events. Most of them were mild, and you can see they didn't differ between Islatravir and placebo. In fact, placebo numerically higher in terms of adverse events. There were two discontinuations for a foreign body sensation, rash pruritus, um, but in general, adverse events were uncommon. And here were the pharmacokinetic, the drug levels of his Latrovir triphosphate. And you can see either with 60 milligrams or 128 milligrams, uh, looking at four weeks, four weeks after the sixth dose or eight weeks after the sixth dose, they are achieving target concentrations. And both doses did that. So generally well-tolerated target thresholds achieved and so they have picked 60 milligrams for the phase three dose for PrEP. So again, imagine this will be likely a head-to-head -head comparative study of PrEP. Imagine if you could take one pill once a month for PrEP. Well, one of the new drugs that we have our eye on is a new class of drugs, the HIV capsid inhibitors. Just to remind you what that is, here's HIV and it uh, finds its target, the CD4 cell, and then loses its envelope. Exposing, shown in green here, is the capsid, which encases the RNA of HIV. Uh, reverse transcription occurs. This capsid helps transport the uh, DNA to the nucleus of the cell, and then new viral RNA and proteins are made, and then it has to assemble into a new viral particle, including the capsid, and only then will the viral particle be fully um, infectious and able to attack another cell. So the new drugs, the capsid inhibitors, actually inhibit this life cycle in two different ways. They inhibit capsid disintegration and nuclear transport, and they also inhibit capsid assembly and release. So we know from infectious disease, inhibiting a life cycle in two different places is powerful. The candidate drug is lenacapavir or LEN. And so what is this? It has potent antiviral activity. Note we're on the picomolar, so highly active against subtypes. Um, and again, a very long half-life. So low clearance and solubility that will allow infrequent dosing. It's being developed with oral and sub-Q formulations. It has potent antiviral activity. Again, one dose at time zero shows a two log drop by day nine at the highest doses. And this was interesting, new sustained delivery formulation, giving the drug sub-Q. And what you see here 
It could be dosed every six months at the highest dose tested and achieved target levels which were above threshold. So this is a subcutaneous drug that could be dosed every six months, potentially. We did learn about resistance to capsid inhibitors, and it won't surprise you that it's substitutions in the binding site to capsid. And so we have to learn new letters and numbers. The chief one of concern is a substitution at position 66 of the capsid, and that confers resistance to lenacapavir. And so this was the new study that we saw at IAS. It's a study in treatment naive patients, ongoing phase two randomized open label control induction maintenance study for treatment naive viral loads over 200, CD4 is over 200, and a smallish sample size. They were randomized two to two to one to get lenacapavir given either sub Q or orally and combined with TAF and FTC together. So three drug regimens. And then the control arm was TAF, FTC, and Bictegravir. We heard about the first 28 weeks, and I'll show that on the next slide, but the plans are to simplify, get rid of the FTC, and go with either TAF as the second drug or Bictegravir as the second drug. So what did we see? While well, the study population, only 7% women, but 54% Black, 45% Latinx, 15% had viral loads over 100,000, and everyone did well. So whether it was the sub-Q lenacapavir in groups one and two with two nukes, or the PO lenacapavir with two nukes, or the control arm BIC and two nukes, 92 to 100% suppression by week 28. So showing lenacapavir part of an effective regimen for initial therapy. There was one failure who developed resistance um, uh, and as you would guess, did select out resistance mutations in the capsid at position 67 and 70 and also a nuke uh, mutation M184I, uh, which we know confers resistance to FTC. The, uh, and this person had LEN concentrations in the target range. So it tells us something that resistance can emerge. Okay, the, one of the exciting studies from CROI that we heard follow-up from was called Capella. This is lenacapavir in treatment experience patients. The, that group typically has multi-drug resistance. So a drug with a new mechanism of action would be a benefit. This was a phase two, three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study, people with MDR HIV. So resistant to at least two drugs in three of four classes and confirmed detectable viral load with less than two fully active agents to go to. And it was a small pilot study of 36 people. They continued their ART and added either lenacapavir in an oral form or placebo. And then at day 15, optimized the background regimen and converted over to subcutaneous lenacapavir dosed every six months. And what did they see? So the primary endpoint was the percentage who had at least a half log drop in viral load and lenacapavir 88% did versus only 17% in the placebo arm. That is highly statistically significant and fulfills criteria for phase three in treatment experience patients. So these data are under review at the FDA. But of course, we'd like to go beyond day 14 and they did too. You can see the difference in viral load changes, lenacapavir in blue. But after optimization and going over to sub-Q lenacapavir, what you see here by week 26 is that 81% were able to resuppress their viral load to less than 50. So that strategy of optimizing and then adding sub-Q lenacapavir worked for these treatment, highly treatment experienced patients. It was generally safe and well tolerated, and then they concluded virologic suppression. Well, we heard the follow-up data at the IAS meeting, and they presented a few more details. The mean change in CD4 count was plus over 80 cells, and uh, the proportion uh, who had CD4 at baseline was 22% or less than 50, and by week 26, none. So they all had CD4 reconstitution. 
Safety uh, injection site reactions occurred, but were mild. And then four developed resistance with that M66I mutation. This is looking at the percent less than 50 with the number of fully active agents in the optimized background. We prefer one or two in addition to lenacapavir. You can see in the small number of people who had zero, even uh, several of them had suppression. And then just a word that this will be explored as well, uh, the analog of lenacapavir in PrEP. So imagine having a sub-Q every six months PrEP drug. And that's based on this MACAC study, which what you see here is they gave subcutaneous injections and then challenged them with SHIV. And uh, while all the placebo controls acquired SHIV, uh, you can see that at the higher dose, none of six macaques with the subcutaneous analog of lenacapavir became infected. So this will support moving forward with lenacapavir studies of PrEP. Lastly, HIV and COVID-19, what did we learn new? Well, the first is from Spain, a cohort called the Pisces cohort. And what they did was actually to a large population-based cohort study from 16 collaborating hospitals with uh, a large population of people with HIV, over 13,000. They compared it with general public health records to determine who got COVID. And what they found out altogether is 6% of people with HIV were COVID positive during the time when they looked. Of them, 14% were hospitalized, 0.9 admitted to an ICU, and 1.7 died. They went back and looked at factors associated with a COVID diagnosis and found MSM was associated, migrants to Spain from other countries, people with greater than four comorbidities. And in, interestingly, injection drug use was associated with a decreased risk of COVID. Hard to understand that, but that's what they found. And then they found what were the factors associated with more severe COVID outcomes in people with HIV and importantly, detectable viral load levels, older age coming from other countries or comorbidities. Interestingly, CD4 less than 200 was a factor, but only among those who had detectable viral load levels. Quite different was the WHO experience. So this is an observational study during COVID of over 168,000 hospitalized patients from 24 countries. And of that group, 9% were people with HIV, so over 15,000 people. And they characterized them. So who were they? Interestingly, 37% men, 63% women. Remember, this was coming from all over the world, including Sub-Saharan Africa. Median age 46, 92% were on ART. Severe and critical COVID was seen in 36% of them. Most of them had underlying conditions similar to the general population, hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. The mean duration of hospital admission to death or just discharge was just over nine days, as is the standard population. 23% of them had in-hospital deaths and the factors associated were being a man, being over 65, and having diabetes or hypertension. Again, similar to the general population. However, HIV in this cohort was independently associated after adjusting for age, gender, disease severity, and comorbidities with severe or critical COVID presentation, so 13% increase, and with in-hospital death, 30% increased risk. So they concluded that HIV was an important risk factor uh, for severe illness or in hospital death. And that contrasts with the Spanish data I just showed you. It also contrasts with some US data that was presented at the IAS meeting. This is from the American Heart Association's COVID-19 Cardiovascular Disease Registry, 107 US hospitals with over 21,000 people um, hospitalized for COVID. And they looked at what were the risks for in-hospital mortality. And then there were some secondary endpoints such as cardiac events, ICU admission, and being intubated. There were 220 people with HIV in their cohort. They matched them three to one with HIV negative people. 
And here's what they concluded. In hospital mortality was the same. 16% people with HIV versus 15% other patients. And you'll see that the p-value not significantly different. In fact, none of the endpoints were different. A major cardiac event, ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and even length of stay. None were different between the two cohorts. So they concluded that HIV was not significantly associated with these other outcomes. And then lastly, the Prevenir study, which is ongoing in France, uh, took a look at people taking TDFTC, TDFFTC for PrEP and seeing if that had an effect on acquiring COVID. And you've heard this story that people in other cohorts who took TDFFTC or TDF3TC had fewer COVID episodes. Well, the French took a look independently. So Prevenir is looking at daily or on-demand PrEP and have about 50% in each. They matched them with men from another registry who were not taking PrEP, so study of over 1,600 people. What did they match on? Being man, age within five years, socio-occupational category, and the date they looked. The median age was similar between the two groups, and in terms of COVID testing, here's what they found. So they were looking at antibody testing, the spike protein. Overall, about 10% of people taking PrEP versus just over 9% of those who didn't take PrEP had COVID antibody positive. That's not significantly different. They looked among people taking TDF, FTC, either daily or on demand, and you can see the numbers are similar, about 10% in each group, not different. So they concluded TDF-FTC does not reduce SARS-CoV-2 acquisition. And the Spanish actually had a prospective study which should answer this question once and for all. I'm gonna stop there and uh, like to thank people who loaned me slides, like to thank the IASUSA for sponsoring this webinar and uh, of course the patient volunteers. So I'm happy to open up for questions. Oh, shoot, I have a couple more slides, I think. <laughs> so let's do post, we'll do this and then we'll jump into questions. Post test question number one, see if you were listening closely. Approximately what proportion of the world's population of people with HIV is currently taking ART? 25, 33, 50, 75, or 90? And the answer is, okay, 86% of you, thank you for listening. So it's 73%, so 75% is the closest. And let's see here. The second question is, which of the following HIV prep regimens is not under clinical investigation? Daily oral TAF FTC, weekly TDF FTC patch monthly oral islatrovir, every other month injectable cab, or every six month subcutaneous lenacapavir. All right, 76% of you correctly identified that there is no patch yet for PrEP, although people are thinking about it. 17% uh, of you said daily oral TAF FTC, but that actually is well-established and FDA approved right now for men and the studies for women. Maybe that's what people were thinking. The studies for women are ongoing. So I believe that's my last slide. Let's see. Yeah, so if you have questions now, we'll put them in the QA button. And I'm going to just jump right in there. I see nine questions already. And we'll take as many questions as we can for the remainder of the time. So let me take a look. Oh, some friends are here. <laughs> in so Tristan Barber from London, good morning, asks, uh, in the DHHS guidelines, why is there any rationale for including abacavir, 3TC, dolutegravir, given the short and long-term toxicity profile of abacavir, and that for most, DTG, 3TC, or an alternative combo is preferable? 
And uh, I can't speak for the guidelines, although I am the co-chair, so I'll put on my private citizen hat and say, I think it's in there because it's the only co-formulated pill with dolutegravir, um, has solid clinical trials information, and, uh, and that we wanted to give some options. But, uh, but I take your point, and others have questioned a back of here. All right, let's see. Tim Cantor asks, there, ooh, okay. There was some data in cabotegravir in PrEP on the IM injection missing the muscle on ultrasonography. So perhaps a similar thing happened in those with low levels. That's a really good point. Um, the, uh, it is recommended that the cab and ropivirine be injected in the outer, upper outer buttock to hit the gluteus medius. Uh, which is something that nursing staff is well trained to hit, but occasionally you can miss it. Um, it can be challenging in obese patients sometimes to locate that muscle. Uh, certainly buttock implants or tattoos can also be challenging because you have to miss them. So you're right, perhaps it is missed on occasion. Um, let's see, trop is not necessarily adherence as no one who failed missed a dose. It could be the injection. Oh, I think that's getting at the same point. Um, rarely injections can miss the muscle. Uh, how would you check for ropivirine resistance in patients who are virologically suppressed? Excellent question. What you really need to do is go back and get the prior resistance tests if you can put your hands on them. That's the best way to do it. There is the uh, DNA test that you can send um, and if it showed real pivorane resistance, the DNA genotype test in people who are suppressed, you, uh, if, if it shows you something, then I would act on it. If it's wild type, then you have to be somewhat concerned that maybe they just missed the resistant virus. Of course, taking a good history, making sure that the person did not fail a prior, either a Favarin's, Niverapine, or real pivorane regimen, would be one of the ways to do it. So history plus any old resistance test that you can do. Uh, let's see, is Salsa game changing for you or are we still missing essential data for a stable switch to Talutegravir 3TC? Um, Salsa and Tango together, I think show us that switching someone on a triple regimen who's doing well, as long as the caveat still holds. So no prior failure, no prior resistance to nukes and integrase, and no concomitant hepatitis B. This looks like a fairly convincing strategy. Um, you know, I think in the clinic sometimes it's patients are saying, I'm doing well, why do I want to drop one drug? And uh, that's okay too. Um, but it looks like uh, we now have good study information to support that switch. So I think it's a reasonable thing to talk about. All right, let's see, any new evidence for management of patients who repeatedly have virologic blips, less than 100, despite being on one of the robust first-line PO integrase combination regimens? Uh, they always fail virologic genotypic testing. So thanks for that question. I think what you're asking about is low-level viremia. And you're right, if someone's less than 400 or less than 200 and has quantifiable viral loads, so viremia demonstrated, it's often impossible to get a genotype test. But the good news is I didn't see new information at the IAS meeting, but there's plenty of published data to suggest that these people have low level viremia, which is not selecting resistant virus. So what's the source? I think many people think that it is part of the reservoir that just occasionally will spit out some viral particles and contribute to that. Uh, some people just have a low level viremia set point. So although they're not below 20 or 50 copies, they're very stable. How do you prove that in clinic? Well, the only way to do it is to repeatedly sample them. So take a viral load level and then another and then another. And all of us have maybe, I don't know, 5% of people who have low level viremia, which is very stable. In previous studies, people have tried switching antivirals, adding antivirals to that group, and it has no effect. So I think you can reassure the patients and, uh, and tell them that 
they have a stable low level viremia. And also people sometimes ask about transmission in that group. And remember that the old studies on transmission saw zero transmissions if the viral load level was less than 1500. Another question about lenacapavir, does it have a sufficient resistance profile to support continuing development as a very long acting agent? Uh, that's an insightful question. So I did show you that there was resistance described, one episode on the treatment naive study and four episodes on the treatment experience study. So that's giving us some clue as to the barrier to resistance for this drug. And certainly when we talk about dosing it every six months, we're gonna want partners for it. Um, so I think time will tell if we can combine it with other drugs um, and make long, long acting regimens, which will be durable. Let's see, do I have any insight when updated CDC PrEP and PEP guidelines will be published? Uh, I don't, I think we're all waiting for those. Uh, they do date back several years. There's a lot of new information. Um, I can refer you as a New Yorker to the New York State PrEP and PEP guidelines, which were updated more recently. I would uh, anticipate that we'd see something new from the uh, CDC soon. Here's another one. Do you think cabrilpivirine would be a good option for patients that aren't that adherent to help them be more adherent? Uh, excellent question. It's what we would all want, right, is to use this injectable for a group of people who are not adherent. That was not the group that was studied in any of those three big studies I showed you, the FLAIR, the ATLAS, and the ATLAS 2M. They took highly adherent people who were suppressed. There is an AIDS clinical trials group study, ACTG study, looking at people who have challenges with adherence and that's actually looking to see would they benefit from cabrolpivirine. So I don't think we have the data yet to do it. It's obviously the patient population we'd like to use it in. And uh, whether it's every four weeks or every eight weeks, time will tell. Every eight weeks certainly looks promising, but we need more data, I think, before we routinely give it to people who aren't adherent. Um, it certainly would be attractive to use it in that group. Do calcium, magnesium, and zinc interfere with integrase inhibitor levels? And the answer is yes. So divalent cations, um, of which the ones you asked about can be, can interfere with the absorption of integrase inhibitors. This mostly comes up with two things. One are some of the magnesium-based antacids, and the other are with multivitamin pills. So you would, you should tell your patients not to take integrase inhibitors once a day at the same time they're taking the magnesium-based antacids or a multivitamin pill. Let's see, cabrolpivirine injectable treatment will put adherence monitoring into the provider domain rather than the pharmacy. Will that affect implementation? Excellent question. And this is widely discussed out there. I think, uh, whose responsibility is it if a patient misses a dose of uh, cabotegravir rolpivirine? It's kind of bouncing back to the clinic, interesting, or per, and rather than to the pharmacy. So who makes the call to say, hey, you missed your injection, you need to come in, or switch over to pills if you can't come in? And uh, so I think you're right. I think that's a conversation that's going on right now across the country. How do we deal with people that miss their monthly or every other month injections? And whose responsibility is that to keep track of it? I think many of us are trying to implement systems to help with that. Um, someone asked about updates for pediatrics and uh, I apologize, I only had so much time. Uh, to talk about pediatrics, so I didn't focus on major developments in pediatrics. My apologies for that. So that was the last question I have, unless there are some burning ones. I didn't look in the chat, but uh, put them in the Q&A if you have anything last minute. Give you guys a minute to do that. I can look in the chat. Lots of thank yous, which I appreciate. I 
here's one. Uh, would you expand on your comment that adherence contributed to low rupivirine trots that were associated with failure? And uh, the primary analyses reported a high proportion who received their injections. So again, really interesting question. And uh, there are a group of people who get abotegravir rupivirine injections yet still have low levels. Why, how do I know that? The data I know best are from the HPTN 083 study. So not a treatment study, but a prevention study that was comparing injectable cabotegravir every other month to daily oral TDFFTC. There were a small number of patients on that study who ended up seroconverting, becoming HIV positive, and had adequate cabotegravir levels. So that there's something there that we need to understand better. It's, uh, it's not common. So not common for PrEP and not common for treatment, but it can occur. And a couple other questions came in. Thank you for that. Oh, and some old friends too. Nice, nice to see you. Um, I was surprised that the weight gain was higher in the two drug regimen, dolutegravir FTC, than the three drug regimen, which was dolutegravir TDF FTC. Any comment on why that would be? And uh, yeah, so TDF in general is associated with weight loss. Why is that? We don't know. Um, we know it best from the PrEP studies, particularly in the first two weeks that there can be oral GI symptoms. So some people have postulated whether that confers weight loss in the setting of TDF, uh, that perhaps you lose your appetite. But study after study has shown that TDF is associated with weight loss. And if you switch off of TDF, you can have weight gain. That's best been demonstrated in the TDF to TAF switches where there has been weight gain associated with TAF. So in general, I would guess that's why the difference. Dolutegravir 3TC, switching off a three drug regimen means you're stopping the TDF. Here's another late question here. Uh, do you have any insights into the expected timeline for implementation of these now relatively well-established data and modified guidelines into real life access to our patients? In real life, a lot of these patients eligible for PrEP are also on state-sponsored insurance. Um, a lot of this has made its way uh, into publication and then into guidelines. And oftentimes the federal funding programs look to the guidelines for what they should support and the states often follow. Having said that, it depends on what state you live in um, as to how many of these options are really out there. So recall right now, for example, uh, the approved FDA PrEP drugs, TDF-FTC came first, one pill once a day, oral, and then TAF-FTC came next, one pill once a day. So those are the only two FDA-approved treatment regimens for PrEP right now. If you know the data from the uh, Ypergay study and the Prevenir study from France and Canada, you'll know that on-demand PrEP has shown good efficacy, but is not FDA approved. So some guidelines actually suggest that as an alternative, again, including New York state guidelines. The newest drug on the block for PrEP is injectable cabotegravir every other month. And the New England Journal study, first author Landovitz uh, for HPTN 083 actually showed superiority of an every other month cabotegravir shot for PrEP. That is not yet FDA approved, so not available. Um, it's finding its way into guidelines, but really FDA approval will be necessary prior to um, both federal and private insurance companies picking up that PrEP option. And then some of the other things I pre previewed for you today um, will find their way into both guidelines and then to the insurance companies. Most insurance companies are paying for PrEP, by the way. And you may know that the National uh, Prevention Task Force um, convened by the CDC did recommend PrEP with a grade A rating. And uh, that needs to be paid for by insurance once it gets a grade A rating. 
All right, I see no other questions. Any last minute issues? All right, very good. Jose, do I turn it back over to you? Yes, thank you, Dr. Gulick. So evaluations and information on how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. And this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's live broadcast. As a reminder, there will be a second live broadcast of this webinar scheduled for next Tuesday. And for more information, please visit the IAS USA website. Here is a list of the um, upcoming webinars that we have as well. And a new IAS USA website feature, Practice Question of the Week, is now available to help our audience stay informed of the latest um, information on HIV, COVID-19, and other viral infections. This will appear as a pop-up when you visit the IS USA website. Here is information for our upcoming courses. Again, to register for them, please visit the IS USA website. And the 2021 annual Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Clinical Conference will take place from Sunday, October 3rd to Wednesday, October 6th. Again, we'd like to thank our presenter, Dr. Gulick, and to the audience for your participation. This concludes today's webinar. Thanks.